Good morning, Floss Tube. This is Cynthia back again with another video. And uh, today I actually have a little bit of show notes, <laughs> if you will. Uh, I know I keep using these crazy terms for everything, but basically I just wanted to have more not really a structure, but just something to keep me on track so I don't ramble too much. But anyway, the first thing that I want to do is quickly do just a few shout outs. Uh, first of all, I want to say hello to Danielle from Stitcherista. That is her name here on YouTube. And uh, she is really the first floss tuber that I started following. She's the one who started my interest in diamond painting, and uh, I've finished about six of those so far, um, and I have a dozen more in my drawer. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm, I'm not buying any more of those for a little while because I want to um, A, focus on my stitching, and B, um, actually complete my diamond paintings before I order more. So I don't want to just be a collector. I already collect enough things that aren't being used. <laughs> so I don't want to fall into that trap. But anyway, so shout out to Danielle. Um, I watch her videos all the time. Love her weekly vlogs. Love her. Um, so I'm a big fan. And then the other person that I have been watching quite a bit of lately is Kyle Reckemeyer from Stitching and Sound, I believe is uh, his name here on YouTube. He is hilarious and adorable and really does some beautiful work as well. So um, I am certainly going to continue watching. What I've been doing is uh, going back and watching some older videos um, and then trying to keep up on the new ones. So anyway, those are just two of the floss tubers that I personally enjoy. So anyway, um, I guess I'll just start right off the bat and show you uh, my Mirabilia Queen Mermaid, which I actually finished because the last thing I needed to do for her was um, the outlining or the back stitching details and of course all of the beading. So I actually did add just a little bit of the gold Krynic, um back stitching for the crown. Um, the original pattern just has beads, but I really wanted the top of her crown to look um, a little more structured like a crown really would. So I just um, did some back stitching around these little uh, shapes and I like it you know um, it's extremely subtle but I think it just kind of creates more of a crown image so anyway um, here she is I'm going to just slowly <laughs> unfurl her I could do this much better uh, and I will include some pictures at the end of this video um, some nice flat still photos of her but yeah it's always nice um, with the back stitching it is always nice to see um, the whole pattern come to life and then this is a good example here so when I and honestly um, I just want to quickly preface this by saying that um, I don't even know how many years I've owned this pattern before I did this stitching. So um, I may have the old pattern, which apparently had some errors in it. Um, but they have you leave, they, you know, the pattern itself has these big open areas um, where there's no stitches and that's where your teardrop crystal goes. Well, as you can see on this particular one, you can see how open it is all around that crystal. So on the other crystals, um, I've already, oh dear, um, 
there we go. I've already stitched around. I kind of moved the crystal and stitched around so that it doesn't uh, look like this. So obviously on this right here, um, I do need to finish um, filling in those empty stitches or empty spots around the crystal so it doesn't look so strange. But anyway, and here you can see another example um, of those open spaces. So just because the crystals obviously move, um, I didn't want all of that blank fabric showing. So I'm going to actually go in and complete those two. So officially she's not done. I'm a liar. <laughs> anyway, I like the back stitching because it really makes everything pop and it really brings the entire design together. And then you would be surprised. I was surprised. I was thinking I was doing so well. And uh, then I realized there's a tremendous amount of beading here in the bottom portion and the tail. Well, at least part of the tail. Uh, there's quite a bit more beading to be, or that needed to be done. But I finished that all last night. I was listening to a podcast and stitching. Oh, goodness. I'm sorry. This is such a mess. I'm not really showing this very well at all. But like I said, I will include pictures at the end. So anyway, um, I love the mermaids. Not all of them, but... Um, certainly the older mermaids um, are some of my favorites. And then I actually did want to uh, send out just a tiny request that I am trying to find Mirabilia's Mermaid of the Pearls. That had been on my wish list forever. And I just, I have no reason why I never bought it. Um, I should have years ago. But I didn't. So anyway, I am now looking for Mermaid of the Pearls. So if anybody knows an affordable <laughs> option, or if one of you lovely floss tubers out there um, have that pattern, you know, maybe you've already stitched it, and so it's a used pattern, and maybe you'd be willing to part with it, or, you know, maybe you have it, and you just, you've lost interest in it, you know, you've moved on to other things, you're never going to stitch it, um, I will be happy to purchase that from you. <laughs> so anyway, I uh, just wanted to throw that out there. So if anybody has a lead on a hot pattern, let me know. Um, what do I have here? Hmm, nothing. All right. Anyway, um, the other thing I was going to mention is that I did actually film uh, last night a little clip of me doing some of the beading here in this area. And I just wanted to show you how I attach my beads. And um, it's probably nothing earth shattering, um, probably no new information, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, sometimes people watching these floss tube videos have never added beads on a cross stitch pattern. And so they're curious how to do it. So um, go ahead and watch the next little clip where I show you me attaching some beads. All right, so I have a big close up here of my Mirabilia Queen Mermaid. And I just have my little needle here and it is threaded with my Nymo thread and I have already knotted it on the, well, secured it on the back. And here is my next open spot in my stitching. So I'm going to take my little container of beads. And this is actually the wrong color. Hold on. I have different layers to this container. So I'm just going to pick up one of my beads right here. And I apologize. 
how this might turn out but I'm going to run my bead all the way down the floss so that it's resting on the fabric and the reason I do that is because you don't want the bead to get snarled up in your little length of thread so if you try to run that bead down the floss while you're pulling through the fabric it could cause problems so you can see that that has put the bead on but it's still a little loose so what I like to do is I will come up again right where I started and now I'm going to pass my needle through the bead a second time and then I'm going to hold the bead while I pull through and you can't see but I'm snugging snugging that floss up very tight so that that bead is super secure and in the perfect position and then I'm going to just go down through the fabric again and now my bead is secure and by double securing the beads they move a lot less you can still manipulate them a tiny bit but they're pretty well anchored so what I like to call this technique is um, my first attachment of the bead is the anchor and the second pass through is the lock so I'm really securing that properly so again you can see in the square I'm coming up through the bottom right hole I'm going to pick up another bead out of my container allegedly there we go picked up another bead I'm gonna slide it see I'm sliding it through and I'm gonna let that bead fall down to the fabric and then I'm going to insert my needle in the upper left hole of that little square I am working on a piece of Ada so it's pretty easy to see where your square is and again I'm going to so that was my first pass through what I call my anchor stitch now I'm gonna come up carefully here we go I'm gonna come up in that bottom right corner one more time and I'm gonna pull then do a nice pass through that same bead again and I'm using my thumbnail here uh, and really the pad of my thumb to hold that bead in position while I pull the floss tight and give it just a few little tugs and really really get that bead tight down to the fabric and then I'll finish that locking stitch by passing through the upper left again so doing those two stitches for every single bead is just going to give me a lot of stability and strength which is definitely something that you want so that is basically the beading technique that I use and depending on how you want to orient uh, the way that your bead lays um, you just go up through a different hole so depending if you want your bead to be slanted one way or the other or if you want it completely straight the choice is up to you all right so I hope that uh, you enjoyed that little clip I know that I was extremely close uh, to the fabric <laughs> you could almost see my soul in that clip but not quite so anyway um, I hope you enjoyed that and one more tiny tip I'm going to give you because um, 
in the skin of the mermaid, um, up near, generally up near her face, you sometimes have uh, blended threads, which just means there's one strand of one color and one strand of a second color. And you hold those two strands together and load your needle and then stitch with the two of them together. And that gives you a nice blended effect. And anybody who's done a Teresa Wensler Oh my, you know all about blended threads. Um, I did actually stitch two of the seasonal carousel horses years ago. I believe that I did the summer and the fall. And I sold both of those, which now I kind of regret because um, I wish I had them back again. But anyway, that's beside the point. So I am very familiar with blended threads. And this Queen Mermaid also had called for uh, one blended thread. So I wanted to show you my little tiny hack for dealing with blended threads. So what I do, and this is what I did a million years ago with my Teresa Wenslers. Um, I just cut myself out of a piece of, you know, cardstock, something nice and stiff. I just cut a little rectangle and then I put some snips just with my scissors. I just go along and snip, 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 um, some little openings. And then I can use those little openings to hold my thread or floss. Uh, so here you can see at the end, I have a little bit of the one color and the second color. So I cut two lengths, one of each color, and then I divide them to, into individual strands and then put them here in the other slots. So as I'm stitching, I just, you know, pull that off and load my needle, and now I've got my blended threads. And it's just an easy way for me to have them at the ready and it just, you know, I don't even need to think about it once I've created this little card. And then, of course, um, I put the symbol, the chart symbol, and then what those two colors are. And uh, then I just have this in a floss away bag, and it's in with my project. So this is my little trick uh, for handling blended threads. And, of course, I'm sure there's many, many other ways to do it. But for me, this just made sense. And uh, it's a habit from the past, and I still do it. So anyway, another little stitcher's hack. All right, so the next order of business is to show you my water garden. And of course, it's not where I thought it was. <laughs> if you could see the table that I'm filming on, I don't know. Hopefully most of you could relate to the mess that's surrounding me, but I'm not gonna show you. <laughs> All right, so here is, oh, you know what I just realized, look. There's a little tiny fabric tag on my bag. This is my new bag that I was raving about recently. So there's a little uh, label sewn onto the front from So Much to Love. That is really, really cute. I swear, that bag is awesome. All right, so here is, and I wonder, okay, here's the top. I sewed on this little strawberry button um, just to kind of always have a little frame of reference as to where the top of my mandala is. And then uh, when I'm done with it, I can just easily snip those threads and remove it. So that was my little answer to the whole, you know, which side is up quandary. But anyway, here we go. Oh, <laughs> isn't she sweet? Coming along so nicely. So obviously, um, last time you saw her, uh, it was just these two bottom triangles that were done. So I went ahead and stitched the two top triangles and did everything for them except for the beading. So um, as you know, these four openings here 
um, are going to hold Swarovski crystals. And then this whole flower motif is all going to be done in Delica beads. There's a little smattering of Delica beads around it. Um, there's Delica beads along this line and more of the gold beads along this line. And then the bugle beads are going to go between all of these road stitches. So that is what that will look like. And then another thing I did, since I had finished kind of the uh, the little, I don't know what I was calling these, little fronds or something, um, since I had finished this one and the bottom, I went ahead and used one of those beautiful silks uh, to stitch these little scroll work areas, which I think are lovely. And there's little beads scattered amongst the scroll work. And again, I haven't done that yet, but that's what those will look like. And again, I did the same thing on the bottom. And the, the colors um, can get quite light. It's, it's really obvious in person, but it might be a little camera shy. But really pretty little scroll work, which is actually fun to stitch. And uh, I don't know why, but these are not as much fun. There's an awful lot of color changes happening in these fronds. So I think that's probably why they can be frustrating. Uh, but yeah, so there she is. I just, I am so excited uh, to get, well, obviously to get all of this done. But um, in the corners and right here, uh, there's these beautiful gates stitched in the gold petite treasure braid and oh, that's going to look so pretty. And then there's also, I don't know if they're, they look kind of like little gates, but they're here uh, sitting diagonally at each corner as well. So there's going to be an awful lot of that beautiful gold. So I am looking forward to getting to that point. All right, so um, I'm not sure what else I wanted to share. Um, I only have so much, and so I don't want to, you know, load an entire video with all of my things. Uh, so I'm trying to, you know, stagger things just a little bit. But there is one more whip that I will show you. And this one... is a pattern that's been in my stash for years. You'll hear me say that quite a bit, and I apologize for the glare. This is a Papillon Creations Love with a capital L. And so this is that beautiful prayer about love. And most people are, you know, familiar. You hear this quite a bit, especially in uh, weddings and things. But it is the love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll block that off. <laughs> it keep, Wait, it keeps no record of wrong? Oh, no. Well, I'm down two. Uh, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So that is a beautiful sentiment. Uh, I shouldn't call it a sentiment, it's a prayer, but there you go. So anyway, um, I just have the pattern here and uh, have some extra flosses tucked inside. And then... Um, in my stash, I happen to have, gosh, I think it was an entire yard of this Belfast linen, and it had been in there forever, and um, I apparently was just waiting for the right uh, project to stitch on it. But anyway, I like it a lot. It's a very pretty fabric, um, and it feels nice in your hands. You know, it has a beautiful drape to it. Um, obviously, it's a little bit wrinkly because I've been putting it through its paces, but, you know, it's still a nice fabric. So anyway, here is how far I have gotten on my beautiful uh, 
pattern. And the L, which is so lovely. And you know, despite the way it looks, it really was a lot of fun to stitch. I was kind of not looking forward to it, thinking it would be a total nightmare, but it wasn't. It was a lot of fun. And I am using one of the DMC color variations. Obviously, this would look amazing in a hand-dyed silk, but um, I, at the time I stitched this, well, I don't have any silks that aren't already spoken for, so, um, but anyway, I just wanted to do something um, that was a little more affordable <laughs> because um, this entire pattern only calls for two colors. And so I knew I was going to need quite a few skeins. And so that's another financial reason that I decided not to do it in silk. Uh, but anyway, I think it looks pretty as is. And I believe... Yeah, this is color number 4025 in that color variations. And it I can't remember the name. It's something about Caribbean, I believe. Um, and then the reddish color, or the cranberry color, really, is 3803 in just the DMC solid. So anyway, those are the two colors I chose to work with. And there you go. And... Um, this border here is very pretty and it completely, as you can see here in the pattern, it's going to end up completely surrounding the entire pattern, um, which again is kind of nice um, when you just want to do some stitching and you don't really want to challenge yourself. <laughs> so it's just repetitive. And my idea with this is that I'll go from, you know, all the careful, careful, careful counting of the lettering, and then take a break by doing the monotonous border. And then go, you know, then when I'm tired of that, I'll go back to the more tedious lettering. And then when I'm tired of that, switch back to the border. So um, that's kind of how I plan to do this so that I never uh, get overwhelmed or lose interest. But anyway, and this is just a little magnet um, that I have stuck on there to hold my needle. And then I did go ahead, um, I didn't need, once I did my L and had this border here, I was able to do the OVE for love without gridding. But then um, when it came to the is patient, is kind, I actually did do just a little bit of gridding. And I've already pulled the grid out of this area, but I have the grid here because I just, I want to be really, really careful whenever there's like a gap. So you can see right here, um, oh, maybe you can't. Anyway, under the love is patient, love is kind, there's a gap before you start this piece here. And so I want to make sure that I'm carefully counting the gaps. Um, because believe me, once you get off, uh, off count, then it's just going to get increasingly hectic <laughs> as you move through your pattern. So, um, I want to make sure that I don't let those gaps, you know, throw me off. But anyway, so that is that work in progress. And another little thing I wanted to say about whips is before, sorry, before I discovered floss tube, um, I first of all, had no idea what a whip was. Uh, so when people were talking about it, I had to look it up and, and figure out what the hay a whip was. And then I realized it was work in progress. <laughs> so anyway, um, the point is that before I had seen that people have tons of whips and they're almost, you know, I don't want to say they're proud of their whips. I mean, of course, but I just mean, you know, um, well, like Stitch Mania, where for the first 15 days of May or whatever it is, I, I, 
I apologize for my ignorance. But in May, you start, you know, a whole bunch of projects. And so you're going to end up with just whip after whip after whip after whip after whip. And I actually, as a individual stitcher who didn't have any cross-stitching friends in real life, <laughs> meaning uh, my friends did not cross-stitch. And so I was kind of always alone with my, with my beloved hobby. But anyway, um, I actually had decided that I had several projects going all at the same time. And what would happen is I would kind of pick the one I wanted to finish and then I would focus on that one completely. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of stitching time back in the day, especially when my daughter was an infant and then a toddler and, you know, all of that stuff. I mean, I always had this child to look after and to take care of and everything else. And so, you know, it would uh, take up most of my time. <laughs> if she wasn't sleeping, <laughs> then I was focused on her. So anyway, uh, for quite a while, I didn't have a lot of stitching time. And so, like I said, I would pull out one project and really focus on it. And it would take a long, long, long time for me to finish that one thing. Well, anyway, all of a sudden one day, once she was in school and I had a little more free time and stuff, I looked around and said, wait a minute, why do I have all of these, what I called undone projects? So instead of thinking of it as a whip, it uh, just seemed like a loose end, you know, something hanging out there that wasn't being used or wasn't being finished or whatever. And so I went through this little phase where I made it my personal mission to go back and to finish each one of those partially completed projects. So that became my goal is to eventually have no whips except for just one. So that's my long-winded story about why I currently don't have a bunch of whips. And frankly, I don't know. I I don't really like the thought of having all of these partially finished projects all over the place, you know? Um, I just, I'm not comfortable with that. I mean, you know, I finished my mermaid, which is awesome. Um, and now I've got my Chatelaine that's going and I've got that Love with a capital L, which you just saw. And I do officially have a couple more. There's at least two more going right now that I haven't shown you yet. But anyway, um, so, you know, that's enough as far as I'm concerned. Um, one of my projects is really close to being done. And in my next video, I'm going to show that to you and share a whole bunch of information about it. Um, but I don't want to try to cram it into this video. But anyway, so um, I'm sure that there are other stitchers out there that are the same way uh, as far as whips go. So um, go ahead and leave a comment on this video and tell me how, how many whips you're comfortable having. Um, because like I said, I look around and see these people who have, you know, 20 and 30 different projects going at the same time. And I mean, I love it and I love seeing all of it and I think it's awesome, but for me, and for what I'm comfortable with, I'm just, I'm not there yet. So um, something like mania uh, is just going to have to be something that I just watch other people do. Uh, and who knows, maybe someday I'll get there. But currently, I'm just not comfortable with it. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for joining me for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I hope that you didn't mind my rambling. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I had a lot of fun. And um, you guys take care of yourselves. Um, have fun crafting wherever you are. Have fun stitching wherever you are. And please join me again for my next video. So take care and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.